Hello and welcome to In, In Our House. House. First, we're starting with something completely different. Have you ever wondered what it would be like in the Stone Age? Yeah, thousands of years BC. Before computers? Yeah, certainly didn't have computers. Now the thing about this sort of shelter is, is that they probably wouldn't have lived in a shelter like this, but they probably would have stayed in a shelter like this when they went out on a hunting trip. Can you see how we're talking? We're working in our pairs. Got it? Yeah. James and Luke will both be here to help you put it on. That doesn't mean that you can't put it on, but if you're having difficulty, they're going to help you. So People use stick sticks to make, to make and, and stems and st when they go camping, camping for hunting. And when you use bones, when you break them apart, you can get some sharp things and, and you can and kill animals. And they also use animal skin for clothes. So when they find the animals, animals um, they will sew up the skin to make clothes and eat the meat. Do you want to hand? You're right. Yeah. This, um, have a look at the lab. This, this lab, would, um, this lab is going to be really cool when we're yeah. going to fix this. Yeah, we're, we're going to fix um. The it's going to be a lab. It's, it's going, going to be, be so a, awesome. It's going to be a. It's going to be a what? cave. Why don't we have a look at the lab and see what it looks like? The Stone Age people used to, bear, um, used to live in these burrows instead of caves. Some of them did. Yeah, yeah, and the loot. What do they and use these for then? They, they lose these to make shows so so at, at the morning they can hunt their own food. So they take the skin off and um, eat them. Right. So when it's like, when it's hunting, so like, they didn't used to have a bath or anything. So, so like when, for example, let's just say there was a deer and it smelled lemon juice, it will run away. And then if I like, and then if the deer smells like, like something stinky, it'll think it's another deer. Around the corner here. Um, on this side. The shelter is used for people who, if it's raining, they could use this stem here to make um so they could go under shelter. Um. The, People ate nuts and berries and they create their own weapons called speeds and bowls. People use sticks to make, to make and, and stems when oh, they go they camping, camping for hunting. And when you use bones, when you break them apart, you can get some sharp things and, and you can and kill animals. animals. And they also use animal skin for clothes. So when they find the animals, animals um, they will sew up the skin to make clothes and eat the meat. We built the shelter out of sticks and um, leaves, leaves and it helps us to the rain not to warm and to keep warm and dry dry and, and keeps us camouflage and it keeps us safe at night yeah. Yeah. and it's a great place to sleep yeah because it's all yeah, so nice it's all like nice stop moving sticks oops like no. can we all feel the rain coming yeah <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't feel it. I can't. I can't. It's a large <laughs> hole there, isn't there, eh? A large hole here. No, I can't feel any rain. I didn't get to feel any rain. Would you like to? Yeah. But when he started working with people, he could hunt better, he could live better, he could survive better. We could do this sort of thing in a community, can't we? Well done. Thank you very much. And now here's Koji with some more news. Now that the Grand Central is open and thousands of people are flocking there, many more will be able to get there soon on the new metro. The metro is to be extended from Snow Hill Station to Grand Central. The older people will be able to remember that Birmingham used to have trams, but they stopped running in 1953. Only one of Birmingham's original trams still survives. Well, where is it? At Think Tank. This is the last Birmingham electrical tram. For 27 years, it was running from Bristol Road between the city to Lucky Hills. 
As Birmingham's population grew, more and more people moved out to the suburbs. They needed transport to take them to work. A network of bus routes and tramways quickly developed. The first horse-drawn omnibus started in 1830 and steam trams began in 1876. The last steam tram ran on New Year's Eve 1906. Motorised double-decker buses were used from 1912. By 1939, Birmingham had the largest bus fleet in the world, providing 400 million passenger, passenger journeys every year. And the last tram like this ran on 4th of July 1953. The museum has lots of films of trams in action. We've spoken to people who remember trams like this. I'm sorry to see them go, but of course it was progress. The, uh, there was more traffic coming onto the road after the war. And uh, bearing in mind, a lot of people said, why did they take them off? I think one of the, well, the reasons they took them off was for the, the safety aspect. Because there were more and more cars coming onto the road, eventually into the 50s, and people had to walk into the middle of the road uh, to get on the tram, which was quite dangerous when the traffic got quite heavy. And, you know, we'd, we'd have all been uh, run over. But that was one of the reasons I think they took them off. And it was a shame, really, because the tramways made a terrific profit for the city. We very rarely had any hold-ups on the trams because of the, the fact that they were guided by lines, a bit like the new metros are today. Snow didn't hamper them, leaves didn't hamper them, there weren't many trees in Lady Wood. Uh, I can't remember the trees hampering them on the Bristol Road. Now we have a, a bit of a leaf fall in the autumn and all the trains stop. Now it's time for Creature Feature. The meerkat is a small animal related to the mongoose family. Meerkats live in the Kalahari Desert in Botswana, South Africa. A mob, group of meerkats, gang or clan usually contain around 20 meerkats but some contain up to 50. They can live for up to 14 years. Meerkat is a Dutch word meaning lake cat. You can see these ones at the Birmingham Conservation Park. Now for this week's spelling mistake. Understanding. Understanding. Understanding and making sense out of information. Interpret, summarise, explain, infer, paraphrase, discuss. I'm sure it's supposed to be understanding. It's probably just a typing error because it's an understanding right here, but understanding yeah. here. This was found in a school which shall not be named. It's from my understanding that schools can spell understanding correctly. Oh, I understand. <laughs> you are watching In Our House from TNT News on Big Centre TV. Now for Fish Fingers. Fish Fingers? Yes, Fish Fingers. We celebrated their 60th anniversary. We're saying happy birthday to the fish finger. Yay! 
Nine? Nine? Oh, nine? What? No. Sixty. Oh. <laughs> I fell in. Fish fingers have been a tea time treat for generations of children. <laughs> it really was a man called Birdseye who invented them. He invented the freezing process in 1927. It wasn't until 1955 that he invented the fish finger. 41,100,516 packets of Birdseye fish fingers were sold last year. That's equivalent to a total of 572,030,831 fish fingers. Fish fingers are also known as fish sticks in America. What do you call a fish with no eyes? What's the difference between a fish finger and a piano? You can't tune a fish. There were two fish in a tank. One said to the other, how do you drive this? Oh, oh, um, no, wait. Okay, it's time for this, this week's, week's mystery picture. picture. So, guys, where do you think this week's mystery picture is? I'm not actually sure where it is, but it looks quite old, maybe Victorian even. And we've got this black door with large hinges yeah where do you think this black door with large hinges could be what sort of building architecture we've also got this on the side it could be something to do with this little fella well here's another look okay so it's so obviously it's a, a clock, clock tower. tower but where is it I think people are gonna need a little bit more time to work this out. So here are a few clues and we'll be back in a couple of seconds. Farley Clock Tower in West Bromwich. Oh. Anyway, now for this. A new survey shows one third of children ages 6 to 17 report they are frequent readers, while 58% of children love reading books for fun. It also said that 83% of children aged 6 to 17 who read books aloud at home liked or loved being read aloud too. 45% of kids surveyed said they had a designated reading time at school where they could read a book of their choice. 68% of children said they would read more if they could have a wider range of books that they liked. Exactly 63% of children want to hear a book that makes them laugh. Both boys and girls both want a book to make them laugh. However, Girls are more likely to want a book that they can relate to and will take them out of real life. Only 41% of children who read books say that there are characters in the books that they wish to be like. 33% of children read books that will teach them something new. But 26% say that they read books and forget all about life around them. 20% of children like to read books that are th about things that they have experienced. Strangely, 13% like reading books about characters that look like them. So, what are your favourite books? Well, my favourite book probably would have to be the Maze Runner series, but I also like this series called Blood Red Road by Maury Rory Young, I think it is. That's really good. Cool. Yeah, my favourite um, trilogy of books is the Maze Runner trilogy. Oh, yeah. Have you seen the yeah. film? No. Yeah, I haven't yeah. seen the film yet. All books are made into films, aren't they? Like, yeah. all the good books. Yeah. <laughs> my favourite book is probably The Hobbit. 
because oh, I, I don't like read that, that much either though. I haven't actually read that. I've got the book. I should read it. It's really long, it. but it's really good. Yeah, mm. I like that. I've been reading. I myself. like the middle school series. It's kind of like Diary of a Kid, but it's a bit different. I haven't I've actually. actually I haven't heard, heard of that. Yeah. yeah right. What about you, Declan? <laughs> I don't know. I don't read books. <laughs> you need to start reading books then. I don't well, read. well, my favourite book is the School of the Pleasant series, which. Oh, you guys I like what? those. Yeah, those cool. I haven't heard, heard of them. My no. brother reads those in a red one, and I really like it. Uh, well, I've I've read. Have you ever heard of the Diary of a Wimpy Kid series? Yeah, 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 yeah that, that, that was really yeah. popular yeah. for a yeah. while. And they've yeah. got loads of like. I think it still stuff. is, you know. Like, yeah. But, well, that's it for the survey of the week. have recently been doing about what computers were like when our parents were our age so we went to find out what they actually look like we're here at the bbc mikey digital exhibition we're going to look at how some technology has changed over the years and you won't believe some of it so this is jason can you tell us where you're from uh, so i'm from the center for computing history uh, it's a computer museum based in cambridge and there's lots and lots of machines that we have out on display that people can come and use and see what computers are like sort of 30 odd years ago could you give us a tour? Yeah, sure. So we've got a number of machines. We start over here. Yep. Uh, so is this the oldest machine? Um, this is the oldest one we've got on display here today, yeah. um, but we've got older ones back in the museum. So this is uh, one of the first games consoles. Um, it's called the uh, Pinatone Pong console, and it was one of the first sort of, it was black and white on your old TV, just a bat and a ball, and you just batted it forward between each other. Um, but actually, because it was one of the first, it was really exciting. Uh, so although it sort of seems really old and archaic now, um, it was really good fun when you first had one of these machines. You played on it for hours. Moving along to 1981. So this is the Osborne One. Uh, it's one of the first portable computers. So I know it doesn't really look that portable. Uh, believe it or not, this machine sort of folds up into a case. It's got a handle at the back, and you can take your computer away with you. And it was one of the first computers that actually come with software that you could use uh, in your office. So if you were a business person, you could take this away. You had a spreadsheet and a database and a word processor, all your office in this one case. Um, but it was really, really expensive. So this would have been sort of a, about a thousand pound to buy back then. So really, really expensive. Uh, but really, really popular as well. There were a lot more people bought it than you'd think. So for a lot of people, it was sort of essential. To be able to take their office around with them was groundbreaking. So yeah, I mean, it was expensive and it was for those bigger businesses, uh, but it still made a big impact. And then later on was quite quickly copied by people like Compaq and those other companies that produced PCs uh, that were also sort of portable. And there's a story about Osborne that they, they argue about, um, but apparently Osborne announced the new machine. So they, this one was selling very well, and then they said, actually, we've got a new one coming out and it's gonna be really, really good. The trouble is, everybody stopped buying this machine because they were waiting for the new one to come out. That meant the money wasn't coming in, so they couldn't develop the new one, and they ultimately up sort of just going out of business. So actually that story's disputed, and there were other reasons, but it's one of the stories that goes around. This is the BBC Micro. It was made by a company called Acorn, uh, who are based in Cambridge. And this is a really important machine because it's the machine that was put into all the schools in the early 80s. Um, and people like me learned to program on machines like this. So although we've got it playing a game here, um, we can stop the game and we can start typing in a program. So we type in hello world. And then another line of code, go back to line 10. So we've got two lines of code. First one prints hello world. The next line says go back to line 10 and do it again. So when we run it, it just repeats and does the same thing over and over. And you get it to do anything we like. And it's really important because it showed a lot of people what computer programming was all about. And today, this is what we're trying to do with the museum, is get uh, your generation involved in computer programming. Because for the last sort of 10, 15 years, schools haven't really been teaching about programming. They've been teaching how to use computers. And it's really important we have another generation of programmers that can create the new games, new websites, and all that sort of thing. So it's really important people have an idea of how these machines work. So this is the Sinclair Spectrum. Um, and it was, it was a cheap computer. So the BBC Micro that we've just seen was about 400 pounds a buy back in the day. So that today is about 1,200 pounds, so really expensive. This was 149 pounds a buy, so it's a lot cheaper. 
and it meant that people could buy that machine. They could buy it in Boots and WH Smiths. It was available to buy in the shops, and they could write their own games. And this is more of a home computer. This was really important because uh, it basically created our now well, partially responsible for creating our games industry that we know today. That's it. So go and go and pick up the fuel. Oh. So. <laughs> Harder than it looks, isn't it? Be addictive. Do you know what I mean? You'll yeah. be addicted to it all the time. I think you just want to do it. Do you know what I mean? Because it's hard. Yeah. So you just want to keep going. It kind of shows that even though the game's simple, so it hasn't got many colours, it's got hardly any sound, but actually it's still quite a good game, it's still quite playable. Yeah. So it shows that all the modern games maybe, with all the big filmic sequences and great sound and everything, actually if it's a good game, it doesn't need all that. Yeah. So these old computers are still quite playable, quite good fun. This machine here is the Commodore 64. Um, the Commodore 64 was the biggest selling home computer of its time. Um, it was a really good machine because it had a bit more memory than some of the others did, um, and it also had really good sound. Um, but the game it's playing here is, is a version of Pac-Man, and uh, Pac-Man's probably one of the, the all-time greats. So uh, it's really good game, really playable, good fun. It's still on sort of modern devices today, so I don't know if you played it on iPads and, and things like that. Um, so you've got the Pac-Man running around the screen there, and the idea is just to eat all the dots on the screen. Um, the fun thing about it is, though, that you've got one screen there to go and eat all the dots, but when you finish it, the next screen is basically the same, um, and you just go round and round again. So it's really about getting as high a score you can. The game doesn't change throughout. So for a lot of people, they think, well, why would you do that? But actually, as you're finding out, it's really quite playable still. So it's good fun. This is called the Commodore from 1982. So loads of people will know the game Pac-Man. Was this the first one that was ever introduced? Um, so no, actually, Pac-Man's older than this machine. So this machine was 1982, but Pac-Man was actually released in 1980. So by then it was a couple of years old. But before this machine had come around, if you wanted to play Pac-Man, you had to go to the arcades. So it was actually quite difficult for a lot of people. When it was available on home computers to play, it meant that we could all play it at home, and that was fantastic. So rather than going to the coast, you could actually play this game at home. And it was a really big deal. So this is the first Apple Mac computer, which everyone knows, and look at it 31 years ago. This is the first Apple Mac computer. Um, as you can see, all it is is a box with a little black and white screen, so we didn't have any colour on them to begin with, um, and there's no hard disk, so to boot it up you had to have put in floppy disks uh, that looked a bit like this. So these are the disks that it would boot from. People like Adobe started creating software for it, Photoshop and all those sort of things, and it became more and more popular in the sort of graphic design industry. So lots of TV companies were starting to use them, graphic design companies, um, and that made them really popular in that kind of industry. And now we've got sort of Macs today, big sort of 27 inch screens and, and all the rest of it, um, which all come from this. So thank you very much for showing us the machines. Now if we were standing here in 50 years time, what do you think you'd be saying? Oh. I hate those questions. Um, I'll tell you what, we've got some signs up at the museum um, and it's got quotes in there saying uh, one day computers may weigh less than 1.5 tonnes, which they kind of do, um, and other people saying there's no reason you want a computer in your home. So these are things that people have said in the past. I'm not going to make any predictions about what the future holds because I'll just look as silly as them when, uh, when that gets said again in the future. But actually, on a serious note, I mean, things are going a lot more personal. So even though these computers were what well, they considered personal computers, we've now got little devices. So the, our computers are becoming our phones, really, or our phones are becoming computers. Um, and they're the devices that we'll probably be relying on more and more. So desktop machines like this, their days are probably numbered. Um, and maybe even computers that are under our skin, who knows? So all we know is that the, computer, the future of computing is really exciting. Because although it's been a lot of things happening over the past sort of 30, 40 years, it's only getting faster. So things are going to change in a big way. Seeing as this is the last program, we're going to need some... Well, we'll show you some of our outtakes. Three, two... Seeing as this is the last program, we'll show you some of our outtakes. Three, two... That's it from this edition of... Two... <laughs> <laughs> Are we saying in our house or team? <laughs> now, this is the remains of a German Woolworth. Uh... Woolworth. <laughs> <laughs> what pop? Oh. Now, 
Chanty Talk. <laughs> Recently, there was a course held for children at Edge Baston Reservoir. The teamwork resulted in. You missed out some lines? No, you can talk together. Hello and welcome to a brand of. Oh, no. Three, two. Now it's time for. Is it only me saying this? Oh, yeah. He says, I don't know. I didn't. Now, this is the remains of a German war. Uh, uh. And that's it for this last program of the series. So goodbye and thanks for watching.